Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Hernando Church of the Nazarene Sunday School class for this November 15th, 2020. My name is Hal Whittet, and I will be your teacher this morning. And I want to thank everybody who's with us this morning. I uh, appreciate you tuning in. And I hope that our time together here will be productive and meaningful for you. By way of explanation, this round ball that you see in front of me is a new microphone that I purchased in hope of improving the sound quality of, of these pre uh, presentations that we do. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Lord's Day. We thank you for this time to gather together digitally, if not in person. But we know that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you will be there also. And so we thank you for being with us during this time. We pray that you'll speak to us in our hearts and minds. Help us maybe to learn more about the church, to have a deeper understanding of the church and your role in it. And we ask for your blessing on everyone who's tuned in this morning, and that everything that's said this morning will be to your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the last time I spoke, about a month ago, <clears throat> I explored the spiritual aspects of this entity that we call the church. I reviewed how the first church was formed when God entered into his first covenant with the, the people that he called the sons of Israel. The sons of Israel being the descendants of the man whose name God changed from Jacob to Israel. Jacob was the son of Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abraham. Abraham was the man with whom God made a unilateral covenant that we can read about in Genesis chapter 12. At that point, Abraham's name was Abram. God changed his name to Abraham at a later time. But asking nothing in return from Abraham, God said to him, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's a quite a promise, a promise that extends across the centuries. But that laid the foundation for the ultimate coming of God's Son, Jesus Christ, into the world, not as we read in John chapter 3, verse 17, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But as an intermediate step, an initial step, at Mount Sinai, God presented his covenant to the sons of Israel, and they accepted it. They said, we will obey. And by their acceptance, they sealed the covenant. When they sealed the covenant, they became the first church, a church under the headship of the God of Abraham, Abraham Isaac, and Jacob. And as I mentioned last time, even the Apostle Paul referred to that group as the church in the wilderness. Now, I'm going to take a side trip here, but I think it's important to point out something that needs to be said. It's something that affects the church. Let me explain something about what I just said, that the first church, the church in the wilderness, was under the headship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That, to me, is an eternally important distinction. So let me explain. As it's recorded in Genesis chapter 3, Moses encountered God on Mount Horeb at the burning bush, and God directed Moses to return to Egypt to deliver the Israelites out of slavery. But Moses said to God, when I go to the Israelites, who shall I say sent me? And as most of you know, God said to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you. But then there was this. God continued his conversation with Moses, and he said this, something that you might not have noticed before. I quote, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. And then God explained, this is my name forever, and this is how I am to be remembered through all generations. So, although books, dissertations, theses have been written about the names of God, and heaven knows sermons have been preached, God said, this is my name forever, and this is how I am to be remembered through all the generations. To repeat, his name by which he shall be remembered for all time is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That's his name. So why am I making such a fuss about this, about God's name? 
because I am concerned for the Christian Church Universal that many local churches across denominational lines are welcoming in and studying and incorporating into their theology and normalizing a religion that worships a deity with another name. They naively and fueled by a desire to be tolerant and inclusive, they use the name God to translate the name of that other deity. So then these churches seek to find common ground to a greater or lesser degree with that other religion. Parallels, common teachings, and other similarities. And they justify that by saying that, hey, we all worship the same God. But in my opinion, that's just not true. In my opinion, any religion that worships any deity that is not, not acknowledged to be the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob does not worship the God of the Bible. And we should not seek to find common ground with them. Seek to convert them? Sure, all day long. But let's not be naive. In my opinion, our churches should be very, very wary of seeking to find common ground with and giving equal weight to any religion that does not acknowledge as its Lord the deity whose name is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think that's important for us to keep in mind. So I said my piece. Now let's go back to the topic at hand. As I mentioned last time, the church in the wilderness was succeeded by the church of Jesus Christ himself along with his disciples. And in concert with that thought, that the church in the wilderness was succeeded by the church of Jesus himself, the authors of one biblical theology wrote that Jesus bore the destiny of the people of God alone, because when he climbed toward the crest of Golgotha, he alone was the people of God. He bore the whole weight of God's work for this world. Further to that statement that Christ alone was the people of God, H. Ray Dunning wrote, it is inappropriate to say that Christ founded the church or that he was a part of the church. He was the church. That's kind of a powerful thought. It's not one that I'd really heard before doing this study, that Jesus was the church. So paraphrasing that biblical theology that I mentioned a minute ago, just like the old Israel, the church is an event that has been miraculously called into existence and is sustained by God himself. Jesus the Christ, as the new Israel, as the church, draws to himself people who are obedient to the Father in the same manner as Jesus was obedient to the Father. He gathers them to himself. Paul wrote in the benediction of his letter to the churches in Galatia, he said, And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. Peace and mercy be upon the Israel of God, upon the new church of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> So I want to speak this morning about the church. I'm having a little problem with my microphone. Give me just a moment. Thank you for your forbearance. I want to speak this morning about the church, what it is, and why we need it. Back in September, Pastor Andy introduced us to the Greek word oikos. And after we got past the fact that he wasn't promoting yogurt, we learned that the word encompasses meaning that has a much lower sugar content. In the Greek, the word oikos is found in several places in the New Testament and it's translated variously as home, as household, descendants, and so forth. In English, household is a name we're all familiar with and it connotes the, the nuclear family. But in the Greek, the usage is much broader and encompasses family, neighbors, co-workers, friends, and everyone with whom we come regularly into contact. And I'll have more about that in a minute. These are people who we could say are within our sphere of influence or our circle of influence. Stephen Covey in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, expanded on this concept of the, the sphere of influence. And he wrote in the context of personal growth and effectiveness within an individual's life. To put it succinctly, we all have what Covey calls a circle of concern. That circle 
of concern encompasses all the things that we concern ourselves with, including, predominantly, things that we don't have any control over. I'm guessing that it shouldn't be too hard or take you too long to identify, identify a few of those. But Covey's message is that we should not spend our time concerning ourselves with things that we can't control. But instead, we should focus our thinking on the things that concern us that we can control, what he calls our circle of influence. The circle of influence is a smaller circle within the larger circle of concern, and it encompasses things that we can truly do something about. When we focus on those things, meaningful change can begin to happen. So Covey wrote in the context of personal growth, but Oikos calls us to focus on our circle of influence with other people, not ourselves. Now I'm elaborating on this because I want to make a specific point. And that specific point is predicated on my assumption that there are a lot of us who think that we don't influence anybody. We don't influence anybody because I haven't reached a certain station in life, because I'm too old, nobody listens to me. Any number of life circumstances that could cause us to dismiss to dismiss the impact that our lives have on others. But speaking from my own personal experience, our lives will influence at least someone as long as we continue to draw breath. It's axiomatic that someone is always watching and evaluating our words and our behavior, even if, even if we're not aware of it. We don't move through life like a ghost. So my point in this is that whether we know it or not, each of us is influencing someone in some way. And think about this. I found one list of people who comprise our oikos that includes all of these. Neighbors, co-workers, local coffee shop workers, grocery store clerks, parents or grandparents of your kids or your grandkids' sports teams, one's hairdresser, teacher, physical therapist, business associate, mechanic, waiter, dog groomer, landscaper, dentist, etc. These are all people with whom we come into regular contact. Now, that's a lot of folks, and we won't influence all of them. But those who have written about Oikos state that our effective Oikos is really in the range of 8 to 15 people. So that's not overwhelming. And if we begin to think of each of these people as someone who is influenced in some way by my life, whether I know it or not, then that opens up a whole new endeavor for us as Christians. Then there's this. This is interesting. One statistical analysis has reported that 96% of unchurched people are open to attending church if a loved one or a friend were to invite them. 96%. That's, that's a huge percentage. And that statistical analysis also reported that 76% of that 96% will stay with the church. So this inviting people to church and speaking to them our, with, about our experience is a very, very powerful force in growing the church. If we read the early chapters of Acts, it's very clear that the Oikos principle was the primary means by which the new believers were won, and they were be, being won at a remarkable rate. Things were happening. And let me make this point, and I want to make it very clear. The purpose of attracting new people to the church, by whatever means, is not, as I recently heard and heard forcefully, was to build attendance. Our purpose is not to build attendance. Our purpose is to continue to grow the church by means of people coming to a saving faith in Christ Jesus, who can then be built up and guided toward maturity by others in the church who are more seasoned in the life of faith. This is not about building attendance. This is about lives. If we were to do a study of, God, of Jesus's commands, I think that we would find one of those commands in the story of his interaction with the demon-possessed man in the country of the Gerasenes. After Jesus drove the demons out of that man, he wanted to go with Jesus, take me with you. But Jesus said to him, go to your oikos, go to your oikos and report to them what things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. 
Is it too much of a reach to consider that to be a command to us too? That we report to our oikos what things the Lord has done for us and how he has had mercy on us? I think not. So what did that man do? According to Mark chapter 5, verse 20, he began to proclaim among the Decapolis, among the ten cities, what great things Jesus had done for him. And then it was recorded by Mark, and everyone marveled. So here was a man who had been demon-possessed. His circle of influence was not anything that you'd like to have. And yet, after he encountered Jesus, he went into the ten cities in the country of the Gerasenes and told everyone, and everyone marveled. So he had influence on them. We all have influence to one degree or another. So along with that formerly demon-possessed man, I think it's a command, a kind of a command at least, to us, at least it's an expectation, to witness to people what great things Jesus has done for us and how he has had mercy on us. We need to do that, but it's paramount that evidence of the work that Jesus has done in our lives be on display in our everyday, day-to-day -day lives, if we are able to have a positive influence. To the contrary, if the witness of our words conflicts with the witness of our lives, our efforts won't bear fruit, and they can only harm the church. To flesh that out a little, we can't convincingly tell someone about how Jesus has transformed our lives and then invite them into the doors of the church if people can't see, in the broad light of day, the transformed life that we profess. But then there's this. Even if the transformed life is readily apparent, a common objection to, to attending church is that everyone there is just a bunch of hypocrites. Well, that's a cop-out, but it's one that we hear a lot. That's a global statement, and like most global statements, it is demonstrably not true. But what is true is that we find within the church a lot of people who are seeking and a lot of people who are saved and sincere, but who are at different levels of grace and maturity within the process of their personal transformation. So you're going to have to see, you're going to necessarily see imperfections. If you're not finding imperfections in people among in the church, then we're really not doing our job. We're not getting in people who need to be here. So yeah, you can look at a church and say hypocrisy, but you should look at a church and say, hey, people are growing, they're maturing. Their lives are being transformed. Now, I have to assume that at least some of you are probably thinking that the transformed life is not a process, that it's a, it's a crisis moment. But Wesley teaches us that the decision and moment of entire sanctification is a crisis moment. It is a crisis moment that ushers in a process of growth and maturation, the process of a life that is being transformed. So entire sanctification is the, is the crisis moment, and then growth in grace continues from there. Having said that, I find this assertion from John Wesley, which I'm about to read, to have a monumental impact on our understanding of the importance of the church in the life of the believer. In concert with what the New Testament teaches when the New Testament is, read, Testament is read in its entirety, Wesley wrote that, and I quote, The great purpose of salvation is to restore man to the image of God. That is the purpose of religion. You may not have heard that before. The great purpose of salvation is to restore man to the image of God. In another place, he defines salvation, and he defined it as the renewal of our souls after the image of God. Have you, ever, have you ever thought about how salvation might be defined? People ask, are you saved? But what does that mean? I think, I know, that a lot of people would respond with something like, being saved means that my sins are forgiven, I'm gonna to go to heaven when I die. Now, according to John Wesley, the purpose of salvation is not foremost to go to heaven when we die, Rather, the purpose of salvation is to be restored to our, our original identity, our original destiny, to be restored right here, right now, to what God had in mind for us when he created Adam and Eve, which is to renew in us the image of God in our individual lives. That is salvation. If that renewal happens, 
Going to heaven when we die will simply be a byproduct of living out our salvation, living out our transformed life. I think that's an interesting teaching. I think it's an interesting, and maybe for most of you, a new way of thinking about salvation. Also, Wesley wrote that there's no such thing as a solitary Christian. Now, that's another global assertion, but his point is well taken, that it requires a church filled with confirmed believers to grow up a new believer into the mature Christian whose life has been transformed by renewing the image of God in his soul. It is virtually impossible to do it by oneself. You need other people. Speaking of other people, and moving right along, all of that brings me to another Greek word, one you're probably more familiar with than oikos, and that word is koinonia, K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A, koinonia. Before I get going down this particular track, please understand that I know that there is a vast amount of literature regarding the church, and that this morning I can touch on just a tiny pinpoint of all that could be said about the church, but I do hope you find this discussion meaningful, okay? Is that enough of a disclaimer? So what is this thing called koinonia? The first time the word koinonia is found in the New Testament is in Acts 2.42, in which we read of the brand new church, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So that word that is translated fellowship, one of, the, one of the things to which they continually devoted themselves is, in the Greek, koinonia. But it's not a fellowship like the fellowship that a British writer described. He wrote, how often are people invited to join us for fellowship after the service? Well, in British circles, that invitation often translates as, do come and drink some weak instant coffee served in ancient green cups have some broken biscuits because they're cheaper, and talk about the weather or your illnesses. That's not the kind of fellowship that Koinonia describes. It's not the kind of fellowship that someone who comes into the church because we witness to someone in our oikos needs to find in the church. Koinonia speaks of being partners, sharers, companions, people who are in this together. Everyone contributes something, no matter how small that contribution might be. Koinonia speaks of a deep and rich community relationships. In Acts 2, verses 44 through 45, we read, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now, this is not, as some say, a call to communism. Nothing that the new, new believers did was coerced. Rather, this speaks to the spirit-directed kind of mutual sharing that Koinonia describes. Just to beat this horse a little more soundly, various sources describe Koinonia as a lot of things. Mutually dependent individuals as a mutuality dependent on one another. Mutual experiencing, joint participation, joint con contribution, one giving to another, mutual interaction, intimacy, communion. There is nothing in koinonia that speaks to some being givers and others being takers. The grand idea is that we're all in this together. Everyone contributes to the community so that everyone benefits from the community. We find instances of koinonia at work in other places in the New Testament. In Acts 6, verse 2, Practical arrangements are made to resolve complaints to ensure that people in the community were cared for so that the apostles would be able to focus on their own roles. In Ephesians 4, verse 3 and in 32, we're urged to, we, were, we are urged to make every effort to maintain unity in the community of believers and to be kind and forgiving towards one another and to be compassionate. All these are elements of koinonia. In Philippians 4, verses 2 and 3, two women who have fallen out with each other are urged to find a common ground. Another person is asked to be the peacemaker who helps to make that happen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 25 and 26, the church is described as a body, so we're reminded that whatever affects one person actually affects all of us, 
whether it is for good or for ill. But back to the book of Acts. Luke describes a community of people who are immersed in the life of God's kingdom, not just consumers, not spectators, not just occasional visitors. Everyone is a part of the team. Everyone is actively participating in the life of the community because every person in the community has something to contribute. And the rest of the people in the community need your contribution, even if you think it doesn't really mean much. But there's even more to the church than people living in community and contributing to that community. H. Ray Dunning wrote that the koinonia aspect of the church is made a reality by the indwelling of the Spirit of Christ. So if I were to paraphrase that in the negative, I would say something like, without the Spirit of Jesus being alive in the church, koinonia would not be possible. So first things first, we need to make sure that we as a church are prepared individually and corporately to be vessels in which the Spirit of Christ can and does reside. We have a responsibility to tend to ourselves and to our church community relationships. As we think about the church, as we think about this church here in Hernando, Koinonia is what a new person should find to be pervasive within our church body and which we would hope that new person would find very attractive, something that they would want to be a part of too. We need to consider that a church whose life conforms to the elements of koinonia is the type of church we need to be if we are to attract new attenders and to successfully lead them to a saving experience of Jesus Christ. And one final thought. As you think about the church, please, please prayerfully consider what contribution you might make, no matter how small, to further the mission with which this church has been entrusted. Thank you for being with us this morning.